it starts. So this is called oh, the mind. Mind has mountains, which is Gerard Manley Hopkins' uh, blood sonnets written in blood in Dublin. Uh, and the kids, I used to call my brothers and sisters all small, and I used to call them the kids. And the kids had a great fear, and, and the great fear they had of me was asking me to help with their homework. Because they had to decide whether it was worth being caught for three hours of Donald explaining something, <laughs> or whether they should just leave and go. So, Brian was past me and he said, and I was playing, Peter Gabriel, Steve Pico was out at the time, and he said, what's Pico then? Because he didn't even know it was a man. And I said, I said, explain it for three hours who Steve Pico was, and blah, 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 and everything like that. Uh, he went by the telly one time, and this is, uh, didn't have a VHS, we didn't have anything. We had a little tin tape recorder, and there was a program on Jared Manley Hopkins, and the telly was up on top of a fridge, it's high. So I used to have, I used to tape the programs with a little cassette tape recorder, as if I was interviewing the television. So, Mr. Jared Manley Hopkins, what have you got to say for yourself? And of course, people would come in the door, Donald, oh, no, man, what? Shh, I'm taping Jared Manley Hopkins, and they're all going, looking around for Jared Manley Hopkins living pizza. Um, and the bit that Brian came in on was um, pitch past pitch of grief of the mind, mind has mountains and it said, Jesus, what's that? And he should have known because when he was a little boy, I dragged him on around Glass Nevin Cemetery looking for Jared Manley Hopkins's grave. And I had to give him ice cream after ice cream after ice cream. He was sick by the time we found Jared Manley Hopkins's grave. Which is just a non-entity, because it's just everybody else who's buried in the grave as well. And uh, the thing with Brian was he was a nutritionist, and he it didn't appear that he was uh, in literature. But if you tell him anything, he likes it. He remembers it. So he went by the telly, just as Jared Manley Hopkins was intoning, or the actor was anyway. Pitch past pitch of grief. Forty years past. Manchester United. Them. Manchester United are champions again for 15 minutes, a whole 15 minutes. City are getting defeated, and in the last minute, City snatch a goal, which means we are no longer champions, and City are champions by goal difference. We are devastated. And I called Brian up and I said, Oh, that was terrible, but he goes, Oh, yes, pitch past pitch of grief. <laughs> the you held that for 40 years, now you're telling me that you do it. <laughs> so, well the mind, mind has mountains. I am angry at this world that dares to throw a scrap of sunlight, shredded through lace, precious as it is, dust molds dancing about your face, you're smiling, you a smiling photograph that the sun attempts to bring alive and fails. The fact of your death still remains. And this is called the All Right Bud. Uh, I'm Donald, by the way. Uh, Brian is my brother, of course, still is my brother. People, uh, when people die, they go, oh, how many uh, are in your family? And they stop counting the dead ones. And you think, ah, he's still my brother. So, you'll always hear me talk to Brian in the present tense, because he's still my little brother. Um, so this is called the All Right Bud. But because uh, Barry is the other brother, and we all get reduced down, melted down to the little syllable, but, as in buddy, buddy, can you spare a dime? You all right, bud? Yeah, bud. You want a cup of tea, bud? Okay, bud. Uh, you ready, bud? Yeah, you're rich in a minute, bud. But, 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 all the time like that. Now, my little nephew, who went to Gale School, and knows more Irish than I do when he's five, looked at us quizzically and said, why do you always call each other penis for? And we said, ah. And that's how we learned that the Irish for penis is what? So the next time, it was going, hey, are you ready, B uh, Brian? And it took us about a year to get used to calling each other, oh, fuck it, we call each other, but what the hell? Hey, wait a second, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, okay. So this is called, are you all right, bud? And curiously enough, we used to have three-hour conversations, six-hour conversations on the phone because I'm over here, he's over there. <laughs> phone stops, one of our phones uh, runs out, we get onto the landline, plug in the other land, and we talk like that all the time. And he was saying that, uh, he was suddenly taken an in interest in my poetry, and he'd never taken a physical interest in my poetry. He said, what are you writing now? And I said, oh, I'm writing poems about heart attacks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is just serendipity, it didn't mean anything. 
And uh, I was writing that poem about a heart attack because I had a heart attack when I was a young man, as you can see. I survived the heart attack. Uh, it was immensely painful and then sheer bliss. Lady Death comes and kisses you on the lips and you go, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'll go with you. And she goes, shh, young man, not yet. And you go, no, no, I don't want to go back. And she goes, I'll come for you again. And you go, oh, no, man. So I was telling him about that and I was putting or taking down a bookshelf for jam. And I was balanced on top of a, an armchair, the way you stupidly do, and going on to uh, another armchair to pull down this bookcase. And I had pulled out a book, uh, Antonio Machado's Spanish code book, called uh, something like Beyond the Dream or something like that, was the selected poems. And I took that out of my hand, I went to make the next step, and the next step wasn't there. I didn't black out, I didn't, it wasn't whiteness, I just went to make the next step, there was no next step. The next step was into infinity. I fell backwards through time and I landed on our uh, shelf with all the orchids. And all the orchids, what the fuck are you doing there? You're not a flower. You're not an orchid. And I was like a puppet, a puppet with broken strings. And I had the Beyond the Dream in my hand. And she thought I was messing. She thought, oh, stop messing, don't You got thoroughly told talking. off for climbing up there. Yes. <laughs> That's what gave me the heart attack. But that wasn't a heart attack, that was just blood pressure or something. So I was telling Brian this, and I was saying that I was sublimated into a poem about heart attacks, and he was listening to this, and he said, if I ever die, Domo, well, this is six weeks before he dies, if I ever die, will you read the poem you wrote for Mother? Uh, and I said, yeah, all right. And now I said, which one is that? And he said, um, sound of something, that one. And I go, oh, yes. So six weeks later, I'm dressed in his clothes, these are his clothes, because I don't wear black uh, anymore. I used to wear black when I was a kid all the time. People used to stop me, think I was a training priest. I'd be going out to Cork in a train and going, Father, can I tell you about something? And they'd tell me for three hours details that nobody should know. And they say, I know you're only a novice priest, but I had to tell somebody for it. So that's why I stopped wearing black, because I just couldn't take everybody's things. Like, oh, this. Um, couple over here who seem very much in love, They're, she's very much older, uh, he's old enough to be her son. And that was the situation. They were having an incestuous relationship and she was saying, is it all right, father, blah, 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 blah. And I was going, oh, I'm a virgin, I don't know nothing about anything. <laughs> uh, so that's why I went to the tie-dye and colored me clothes and stuff like that. So this is called Are You All Right? But all I have to do is change the title in the last line to make it Brian's poem. Sound of sorrow, north northwest of pain. I search for you and lose you yet again. I calculate your absence by the stars, and you are near, though you are far. I wander through this wilderness of loss. Is this what loving you has cost? East of loneliness, west of grief. If only for one brief, your voice echoes inside my head. I see you smile and laugh. You are right. Look at the butterfly it's called. He is looking at a butterfly that isn't there. He is looking at a butterfly that isn't there because I have told him to look at the butterfly. Because I am his big brother, he trusts me that there will be a butterfly. The camera goes click, captures my brother, and the famous butterfly that was never there. Did you see it? Did you see it? Yeah, yes, I saw it. Now that you're dying, I call to you. Look at the butterfly, bro. Look at the butterfly. When he was a tiny little boy, he used to be called, about this age he was called, there wasn't any goods then, he was called the little fella. And my mother, if she was looking through um, 20 photographs, would go, no, Dono, Barry, and then she'd get to Brian, and she would melt. Her face would crease up, and she'd go, ah, Jesus, ah, Jesus, look. Ah, it's the little fella. Ah, Jesus. And that was our immediate reaction. You could wait a minute, show the same picture again, and she'd go, ah, Jesus, ah, look who it is. And we used to do horrible things like hide the pictures and know that it was the seventh picture. And she'd be looking through them, and just as she got to the Brian picture, we'd all go, ah, Jesus, ah, look, it's the little fella. <laughs> and uh, Brian became a far greater man than I am and his stature grew in the world. I became a mere 
meddler with words, a peddler of poems, and he grew up to be a man of the world that could deal with the world on its own terms. And by then we were, to distinguish us, we were uh, Big Bud, Little Bud, and Bud. But he became so much the man that he became Big Bud, and I shrunk down to Bud. So, when he was little fella, instead of even Bud, I was holding his hand when he was four. And he said, can I ask you something? And I said, eh? And he said, you know when you die, he's four now at this stage. And I go, yeah? And he go, no, it's one of those questions that adults can't answer. And he said, you know when you die, is there weather? <laughs> and I thought, right, I don't know exactly how to answer that. And um, before he died, he'd become uh, a member of the Looking at the Clouds <laughs> organization. He actually had a certificate for looking at clouds. There's actually an organization for that. Um, so this is called an acute absence of weather. Tomorrow arrived too late to save you. You had become the past tense, no longer present at your own life. Time had abandoned you, the world turning its back on the sun, staring into the night, a darkness without stars, a faraway barking of dogs, a somewhere that's nowhere, or even the weather vane doesn't know which way to turn, an acute absence. <laughs>